are honored to have Melissa Moyat here. Uh, she's going to show you some work I think is among the most creative and artistic work that I know that also um, really restructures the way that people participate um, with each other, um, how they, the way that people interact with each other, and the way that people participate in urban space. Um, and I think the fact that it is, it is also art is um, sort of the frosting on the cake. Um, so uh, there may be a couple of people coming in late and ask you to give them a little bit of an indulgence because we're in a different room than usual this evening. Uh, and I would like to invite you all to the reception that we'll be having just right outside these doors um, after, the, after the lecture and the question and answer period. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. So yes, my name is Melissa Mangiat, and I run a design studio with Moon Andreas in Montreal. We also have a precious collabor collaborator in Portland, Oregon. And we are a team of about 10 people established in Montreal of people of different disciplines. What we do is we design narrative environments. What are narrative environments? Well, spaces that tell stories. It's uh, creating experience for people that um, can happen from a really wide range of practices. So our approach is multidisciplinary, um, which makes it really blurry. And having a practice that's narrative environments is also not necessarily helping yourself. It's very abstract. Um, and we were thinking recently with MUNA, one of the first conferences we gave, we, it was part of a, a landscape uh, architecture congress. And uh, after the, the talk, people would come to us and they would say, I finally get what you're doing. You're a landscape architect. And we'd be, mm, that's not exactly it, but there's something interesting in how you, when you put your work in a certain perspective, people just associate you to that field of practice. And we were started thinking, oh, wouldn't it be great to start giving lectures in choreography <laughs> conferences or maybe some weird wedding planners <laughs> assembly, um, just to see if people would think that we do that. Um, and then we, uh, we, we started doing a lot of projects in public spaces. And people thought that uh, we are placemakers. That's where they would associate us to. But we also won a big award in interaction design. And that's where we, we have always claimed that, uh, that, that field of practice. And we really felt that we were amongst our peers when we were at that uh, ceremony. And at the same time, um, we, do, we do a lot of arts commissions. So designers ask us a lot, like, are you artists? Are you design? How do you get money to do your projects? So at the end of the day, we don't really care. <laughs> we know the way we do is narrative environments because our passion is to have spaces tell stories. And we love that projects takes us on all sorts of disciplines. Um, and what we really care about is enabling conversations. At the end of the day, when we see success in a project, is if we've had people have a role in the, in the places, in the stories that are told around them. And the places that we work is very much outside, on the street, where it's really gratifying because you work with people that are not necessarily willing to have a conversation. So you need to work a little harder. And what's nice also about public spaces is that they're intrinsically linked to democracy. And that's where we find <laughs> a deeper sense of purpose. Um, there's this beautiful quote from Michael Sandel that says, democracy does not require perfect equality, but what it, do it does require is that citizens share in a common life. What matters is that people of different social backgrounds and different walks of life encounter one another, bump up against one another in the ordinary course of life, because this is what teaches us to negotiate and abide our differences. And this is how we come to care for the common good. When we read that, we really, we've came across this, uh, this talk not so, uh, the studio has been existing for about four years and a half. Thank you. And we ran about this growth, and we've had already done a body of work, but we really felt that this is where we, this is where we stand, and just enabling this mix for people to engage loosely with one another. And as, as, and as we face more and more complex issues, there's a base for conversation that is there. Because cities today, is, as you know, um, with our mobile phones, we're constantly in our bubble. We know from working on the field that it's really hard to get people to engage because they, they're more and more also just connected to the people they want to. Um, if you think of how Facebook links you to, to your own network and it's more harder to get a sense of the many different types of strangers there are around you in the city. 
and we feel it's important because uh, we've also seen a lot of upheaval. We think of Turkey, Taksim Square, um, when, when public spaces are neglected or start to be taken over from, by, from the people, well, that's when you start losing some, some grounds of your democracy. And there's another book. I, I did not uh, send you, Jonathan, any readings because I thought this book would need a little bit of an introduction. Um, thinking of how we can make, how we can generate this sense of common life uh, between people. We were also inspired by this book that was given to us by a friend some years ago, Finite at Infinite Games, if you run by it. Do read it, have a read. It's, uh, it starts being about games. How many of you are uh, like gaming? Are true gamers. Nice. All right. So it starts, you think that it's about games, but it starts to be about life pretty soon <laughs> in the book, and then maybe afterlife <laughs> and more. But what's really interesting is that is the whole concept of a finite game is played for the purpose of winning, and an infinite game is played for the purpose of continuing to play. And you can think of life my, uh, 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 based on that principle, but also of your own practice and also how cities are built. We like to think that we're working for infinite cities, cities that are meant to, be, to have their rules bent and that can, be, can, that can evolve with their people. Historically, cities have been built to be very finite. They're built to last, they're made out of heavy material, everything is bolted to the ground. And what we see now, especially with new, new technologies, is that they're more and more malleable. People can take them over and then can give them new lives that continue to evolve as people evolve with their concerns, with whatever problems arise. And so engagement in cities for us is where we find the infinity, how we can engage people to transform their environment to be more active and make their cities more infinite. Sometimes it can take many shapes. Uh, it can take many shapes. This, uh, this is an early project we did in, at the Minnesota State Fair. For, um, it's uh, Steve Dietz from Northern Lights who invited us to do a piece. Uh, and uh, we, we loved the State Fair. It was the first time we were at an American State Fair. And um, after eating all the food and witnessing how people were interacting with each other, it was great to see the immense sense of, uh, of we are a nation and this extreme positivity around. At the same time, we noticed an opportunity that people were not doing anything together. They were all happy to be there together, but they were not doing, they were not activating this sense that they had, this great feeling that they had inside. And we also noticed that they had this great choir tradition. So we gave them a giant sing-along, a field of microphones for them to simply come together and sing. And we had this uh, giant screen, they would choose their song at the beginning of the summer, and then we would prepare all the, all the material for them to simply come, walk in, no stage, not a performance, walk in and sing together. And singing together is quite powerful. And uh, the project has been ad adopted by everyone and it's been shown now it, for the fourth year this year and they're showing it next year for a fifth year again. Um, Rewrite the Year is a different way to make your city infinite. This one took over a facade of a cultural center in uh, Surrey in, the, in, in BC, Canada. And this time we, uh, we transformed a facade to uh, to make it a space for reflection. It was in 2011, after the Arab Spring, Occupy Wall Street, the Indignados, and we wanted to pay tribute to a year of protest, to a year of social activism. So we revisited 365 headlines from newspapers around the world and invited people to rewrite them as a way to be more aware of what happened and also to imagine what had happened and also what could happen and it took on all sorts of turns as many people engaged. <laughs> there were many different su submissions from funny to very serious to dark to imaginative. And there, everything would happen through mobile phones, simply texting. No intelligent phone needed. You just text like you, as you're used to. We would have a phone number associated to a color and the word and color that could be changed, you could change. And we loved that motto. This came out in a meeting about moderation. Um, they were asking us, uh, so what are you going to do? Can people write whatever they want? And the great thing of working with text messages and mobile phone, most people have access to, to changing what's on the facade. So if you don't like it, change it. And it became pretty much the slogan for all our work, how we can just make people more active and instead of being in a, in a passive and always feeling like you're, you're reacting to things, how can we give you the tools to, to change things around? 
And interesting, this is less about the city, but it just happened at the Walker Art Center. So I thought I'd say a little word, a word about it, because it is truly engaging. And it is about these, um, these two worlds that met. Um, it was firstly uh, presented at the Portland Art Museum. It's the hotline. It's a, it's a hotline to answer questions about art. And it works very simply with a, a phone system and calling cards. And when, while visiting, this was done during the Shine a Light event in Portland, and it was recently done at the Walker for another event. So during this special occasion, it's a special day where the phone line is activated and people can just call in and speak to curators or teachers or different um, actors of the art scene and ask their questions. And it's open to everyone and you are in a, in a space where you're a little bit intimate, so you feel free, there's no barriers, there's no... And, you do, and because you're on a phone, you're less shy to ask your questions. And you could see the types of questions that were asked. <sighs> Why do I not want to be identified as an artist? What is the biggest piece of art in the world? <laughs> who decides who the good artists are? What, uh, uh, what defines art? And there's the who profits from art? So you can imagine this, the, the tension in the room where all the curators <laughs> and, the, and the different, uh, there's also, I think, the, the doyen, the, the director of the Portland Art Museum, different people from all over the place were meeting around the same table, but also connected to the greater public. And they were all very engaged in trying to find the answer. Oops. So it would bridge two communities that rarely get a chance to, to exchange. And it, it it's, uh, raised questions to the people, uh, for the people who were giving, uh, who were making the call, but also to the people answering the call, who were uh, in the end just as passionate and trying to find the, the answer. Okay, so how do we work? Um, I'll show you three projects more in depth. Um, so in this context of the infinite city, we've, and through the years, we've developed this approach that we always work with three big, um, categories of things to observe when we start a project. There's the public, there, who is there, who could be po potential collaborators. There's the space itself, what are the opportunities in the space that we can find, and the stories, what happened, what could happen, what are people talking about, what's the, what's the narrative, the existing narrative in the space, and what could be, how could we change it to become another type of narrative. Um, participation is our uh, as, you do, as, you, as I said, is, uh, is what we do. <laughs> and um, one of the, when I did my master's, my research was on participation, and we tried to give qualities to participation to see what does it mean, what is good participation? Is it when people are watching, they're simply engaged? There are different levels. They can be doing something without necessarily having to change, but maybe when they change, some more magic can happen and the engagement can be increased. Is it when they own, own a piece of the piece? Is it when they share, when they share and they remember together what happened without necessarily having done anything, but just the fact that they're sharing afterwards is a way of participating. When they join, when they join a group, that could be a nice feeling to play with. And of course, we all want to transform people forever. Um, and these are just a few words to keep in mind, that we keep in mind at least, when we work. Um, there are some, we call them our considerations for good participation how it's important for people to feel invited. An invitation can sometimes be an object. You'll see it in a, in a project I'll present with the swings, or you've seen it with the microphones. The microphones are very much an invitation in themselves. You don't need to say anything, but they just say, come and sing. The fact that we don't, we're not using a stage is also shaping an invitation. Incentives, why would they do it? The rules, are they understandable? For instance, the text messages, how easily is it to, to understand how we can take part? and what will generate feedback. And is the feedback interesting? Is it rewarding? And then there are the other ones are less, uh, are more details, like uh, is it intuitive or complicated to use? What's the timing sometimes? The time, like everything is well planned, but you just get the timing wrong and you lose, your, you lose uh, attention. Fantasy is always nice to play with, the senses. How can we play with as many senses as possible? How do we get people to leave a trace? Playing with authenticity seeing if we become co-author and expecting the unexpected. You'll see more what I mean with this project. <laughs> so one of our, if, is, have, has anyone heard about this project? Okay, not too bad. 
I don't want to repeat too much. This is one of our, of our very successful project mm -hmm. because Oprah said it. It's, a <laughs> it's 21 Swings. Um, it happened in Montreal. We were starting the studio. We had been out, out and about for about a year. And we've worked a lot with the Entertainment District in Montreal. Um, Entertainment District is a new district recently um, part of a big regeneration plan in Montreal. This is actually not the most interesting place in the entertainment district. We're behind a big, the Opera House and the Contemporary Arts Museum. We're also behind a big science faculty and we were given this narrow piece of land that's punctuated with this series of modular um, structures that are made to be transformed in kiosks. There are a lot of festivals happening in Montreal. If ever um, you guys have been in the summer, it's festival cities. And so we use these structures to sell beers or merch and things like that. Um, so we, working the way we work, we start to see, okay, what are the opportunity, opportunities here? There's this big thing, this is a, a big lighting post from which we can hang stuff. There were these seven structures. Also opportunities in the people, the big musical arts community from the Opera House and visual arts and the science community as well. Many people walking by, there are science students. How can we bridge these two communities together? So we, we rapidly involved in a science professor, a biology professor. It's unclear, I think, we, I think we found each other. He found us or we found him, but he clearly came to us and said that we do the same thing. He's a biology professor who studies animal behavior. And um, he had recently written a paper on cooperation and the way he studies behavior and how animals learn and how animals cooperate, how an negotiation, how can, how can it happen between um, different species um, was what he was looking at. And in the same way that how we, we, when planning an interaction, you end up looking how people behave. How do we shape the way they learn to, to play with an interface? And so we started working together, and because he had just written this wonderful paper on cooper animal cooperation, we thought we'd work on cooperation in the public space. And uh, having the Opera House right behind us, we thought we'd work with a local composer and see how this cooperation, the reward, could be making music together. So we needed to find the perfect interface. And um, we thought that maybe we could use something playful, and if there's something in, the pub in public spaces that is inherently cooperative, is the seesaw. Um, it was quite limiting though, it's only two people. We tried to see if we could make it more collective. And then we went back to the opportunities that we had on site, those seven structures. Because if we were working with the seesaw, we were only occupying a part of the territory, but not the entire thing. So we thought we'd hang swings on them, which, was, which felt like a great idea until we met the engineer. How many of you are engineers here? I like you um, and I liked the engineer we ended up working with <laughs> because he, the, the structures were not built to hold swings and you can imagine also you saw it's a very narrow piece of land and there are two busy streets on each end. Um, I think, I think when, we were, when we were selling the idea we, we were not thinking about the streets up until the swings were hanging on these structures and we saw people flying on each side <laughs> and thinking what did we do? But still, we started talking with the engineers, trying to see what would be the best way to hang. We started also working with industrial designers, see what could be the perfect design to hang our swings. In the end, this was the winning uh, proposition, to have them all in their, uh, their separate structure that would distribute the weight in a, in a better way and make it all feasible. And now, how do they make music? Um, so the idea was for the swings to make music all together. There were 21 of them, sets of trios, seven sets of trios. And with the, that's what, those were interesting meetings with the professor and the musician, trying to see how people can make sense of what they're doing. We decided on the, on the model where you would trigger a set of notes when you would reach the highest peak of your period. So it's like a pendulum, and the higher you go, the higher the note. So you start with lower notes and end up to your own set. And then there were also different instruments. So you would have four instruments distributed along the 21 swings. So one swing would be an instrument. So you choose your instrument and you would have a set of notes associated to it. And it would sound like this.
up spending about an hour and a half here. I think it's amazing and it's a really, really cool experience to be able to make music with your entire body. So what we uh, what we hear when we hear the scale, that was the true, that was the ultimate cooperation um, scheme that we had planned in the installation. So when people are swing in synchronicity, more complex melodies would emerge. So you would be triggering several sets of notes, and once you start paying attention to your neighbor and go in synchronicity, you'd bring the melody to the next level. So the beauty of the swings is that it's a really simple interface. Um, no instructions necessary, maybe some little warnings not to, <laughs> not to uh, go too wild on them. Um, and everyone understands it. And this was an example of forced cooperation that was witnessed. The cooperation model worked well as well. It was interesting to see how through the years, cause, so this project was presented in 2011 and it's been now opening the spring every year. And we've tweaked the, the music accordingly through the years. And it really became a performance. That's what we noticed. Like people without noticing really start performing out on the public space. They behave in ways they don't, they don't necessarily used to. It also attracted all the neighbors around the hood. And it became part of the city. Like when protest needs to happen, it's one of the places, it's one of the staples where people can meet. Um, and it also tells you a little bit about the challenges of working outside and on a semi-permanent structure, how it needs to be not only robust, but survive uh, outdoors to weather, to we need to have it rodent-proof and also vandal-proof. And the project got great press. We, uh, we were featured in a series of blogs that went viral. Like I said, it caught Oprah's, Oprah's attention. Um, and it was wonderful to see it go all around the world, but one of our favorite articles was very local. It's in the Metro Journal, and it's a picture that's taken by the public and an article written by the public. It was the first year that the swings were presented, and what it says is au revoir les balançoires. It's someone who just said, oh, the swings are being taken down in a few days, and we want to say goodbye, and we hope we'll see you next year. And it's really how the project came back through people writing to the entertainment district saying why are they only shown for six weeks, we want to see more of them. And when you think of a, of a district that's used to big festivals, suddenly there was something of a human scale that they had never experienced and that people loved and cherished and made their own. So we, so we continued. Now the project opens the spring season every year. And on the second year they, they gave us a, an extra <laughs> feature. This is a projection on the, on the building right behind the, the swings installations that, they were, that was giving to us. The, the whole uh, neighborhood is equipped with a series of interactive uh, of pro of projections on buildings that also have the potential to become interactive facades. With this one, we thought when you're on the swing, you can't see what's happening in the big, on, the, on the big facades. So we thought that the, whatever we were doing there would be more for the other passersby. And so what we did, we did this big pinball machine where the flippers and all the obstacles, it was called 21 obstacles to go with 21 swings. And the obstacles, their motion is activated by how the swings are moving. So the data that we get from the swings movement, we would also use to animate what, uh, what was happening on the, on the facade. And people would text balls with their mobile phone. Again, text messaging interface, we love it. And, they would activate all sorts of scenarios, pinball machine style. This is when they would text boom. We would allow that from time to time and the screen would fill with balls. And it would be magic. And so since the, seeing the success of the, of the first year, we, uh, we've been working on a touring version. Um, and this summer is the first summer that we got it out in the world and we had the mountains as our first host, we were in Colorado this summer in Green Mountain Falls for the Green Box Arts Festival, where we presented the swings. In this case, now we have 10 swings, but they are presented all together in a continuous arrangement so that we have an uh, uninterrupted musical experience. Because we were working in trios in Montreal, you always hear only a certain number of sounds, of notes, and now you have them all together. And it's, it's, quite, a, it's quite interesting to see the same project take another shape and become a totally different experience. And another factor that changes the experience is the mountains. 
the setting where it's happening and how it really takes a new level of, uh, I don't know, mysticism, perhaps. And so we look forward to see, I hope that it will see beaches and some weird Asian market maybe, and some more skyscrapers. And we'll see where it takes us. I'll keep you posted if you want to. Okay, uh, next project is, uh, we're back in Minnesota, still working with Steve who invited us to make a, a second project together. This time we're inside. It's a public space, but it's inside. It's at the Union Depot. It's a train station. A wonderful, beautiful historical building in the middle of St. Paul. And that has been, that was abandoned for many years. That was recently refurbished in its original con uh, condition. It used to be one of the most vibrant places in St. Paul. When you think that the trains were in their heydays, it really was the place to meet everyone. And uh, slowly, it was built just when it was at the peak of the heydays of the trains. And then the automobile started taking over. And very quickly, it saw its, uh, all its activity run away. <laughs> So it was closed down for many years, then it became a post office, and then it was closed down again. But it's still a big part of the city's history. And now that it's re reopening, we thought that it'd be nice to perhaps give a voice to that history. We also found out that there's a radio station that was host back in the day in that station, in, the, in Union Depot. So we thought that maybe the voice that we would give it would be the one of a radio host. So what if we had a radio show that's hosted by a building, and, and then the challenge was to see, because the story of the building is not just through books or, or through, I don't know, speaking to historians, it's everyone's connections, everyone's stories. When we would speak to people who were Union Depot aficionados or just passing by, they all have memories with the building. Their parents, they saw their parents go to war through this building, um, or they were intrigued by it through all their childhood, or they have different uh, some people will tell us about how the stars would be there all the time when they were when they were younger. So how do we bring that back? So this time for a short weather report. The temperature lies at 79 degrees. The current weather condition is cloudy. James's advice for a cloudy day. Sit inside and dream. So we, uh, so the radio is uh, is a robot community radio that is intelligent. <laughs> this is one of our weirdest projects. So basically, the radio says, "Hello, I'm the building, and this is my radio show." And we, uh, an example of a scenario can be: It's 8 a.m. Good morning, everyone. People are coming from Chicago soon. Let's cheer them up, everyone. The Cubs lost last night. Hey, hey. No one is here. This feels like the 70s all over again. Nothing. Apparently music was good, but cars made everyone abandon the station. So try to see how we can fit in some, some historical bits, but also just how, how a radio tells the life, the days that go by. And have people slowly take over. That's the amateur side. So amateur intelligence radio is the name of the project. And we, we had five stations that are distributed along the along the waiting room that we were given. So the radio is immaterial, but we needed a physical presence. So we thought of five different modules that would broadcast the radio. And they would be located in different parts of the, of the room where we saw nice opportunities for listening to the radio. So this is how we, uh, so, and it really looks, it's all you know, very simple lines, as if it was part of the building, really. And there's the little interface here where you can plug in your headphones, adjust the volume of the radio. This is the waiting room station, the waiting station. We had a secret station, sorry, uh, that, you, that you have to open the door. These were doors that were, uh, oh, I didn't explain that when you saw the image. These were, uh, these were the doors that would be used to go to the train tracks back in the day, but that they no longer use. So we had these wonderful opportunities of playing with doors that would lead to nowhere. So we, uh, we had the, the terrazzo filled the space, and the sound of the voice coming out from behind the door is quite magical. This is the social station. It's, in the, it's where you can get a really nice point of view of the entire waiting room. And that's where you kind of get the same point of view as the radio host building. Clock station. 
that, uh, that where you can see a one of the clocks. This is the river station where you can see the Mississippi River. We have the Mississippi River, come on, right by the Union Depot. We had to do something with it. And looking at the river, it's also how we can use these point of views to inspire new stories. Because one of the big components of the project is the community. It's a community robot radio. So how can people send in their stories? So we inspire them and then we had this simple interface through a website where we build these different radio shows. It's also intelligent, so we gave it eyes. Uh, this is the camera, so we, the radio knows where, how many people there are in the rooms, if it's busy. It's also connected to the train schedule, it's connected to the, uh, the weather channel, and we can connect it to all sorts of data that gives it prompts for when to trigger stories. So this is the website where they go and write in their own story. And then you can see here, on air when, they decide when they want the story to air. And this is where the, the intelligence plays a role to, to say, to trigger the, the story. One of the big challenges was to make it really easy for people and non-scary. If I say, if I ask you to submit to a radio show today, you'll probably be not necessarily very inspired or, or not even want to. But if I say, oh, come on, Submit a birthday announcement. I'm sure you can find someone you would you could have the you could have a message sent to them to say, to wish a happy birthday, and then you just enter the date of their birthday, and the message is broadcast by this lovely radio voice. Um, and we had more funny ones like message to people going to that are in accordance with the train schedule, things to do when you're waiting, travel stories, questions for next year, that I quite like. Um, where you can submit questions and the, the, the year after you kind of see the, the concerns of the year before you. It's always nice. Arguments for the existence of is maybe the weirdest one where you can argument, where you, where you can argue for the existence of UFOs or monsters. And with the weather forecast, we have all these sorts of advice that can be, advices that can be broadcast. So a big project like that, you need a lot of stories. <laughs> to populate a radio show that is 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, so we started with workshops and slowly also engaging local communities in building the content of this radio. We also interviewed historians and local people working in the area. We have some interviews of the radio with these people. We've had a lot of fun. And in the end, it's the, the place is slowly building an audience as well. So the one of our uh, one of our objective was to create a presence. So if you come into the the waiting room and there's not that many people, slowly you still keep a trace. You still have a trace of the people who were there, and slowly you can build this uh, this sense of presence and have a sense of the people who were there before you, and leave something for them too. So that's Union Depot. Any questions so far? What language was that story written in? Oh, I think what we saw here is Latin. It's just placeholder text. But um, yeah, the, the radio would read, you would get to hear a preview of your story. Right now it works in English. Um, I don't remember what we did. What happens if you submit it in, in Spanish? I think it just, it will read Spanish text in, with English accent. But uh, yeah, that's where it is so far. The last project um, I'm presenting you, we're back outside and we're dancing now. As you could see with the, the swings, we were starting to see how people were performing. It was nice to work on the Union Depot. We had more of a, people really submit content to the project and see how stories can be narrated through a space. With McLarena, it's a little bit different. We were given a space contrary to the Union Depot. It's a little bit run down. It's right by a, train, a metro station though. Still in the entertainment district, but in the, the less uh, snazzy part of it. And um, the Quartier des Spectacles, the entertainment district, had a projection zone here, all set up. And as part of a tribute to Norman McLaren, it's the National Film Board of Canada and the entertainment district who had this big project of having these different stations around the city that would pay tribute to Norman McLaren. Norman McLaren is, uh, is a huge figure of the National Film Board of Canada. From the 80s, 40s to the 80s, he's, he was a pioneer in countless 
uh, techniques that have become hallmarks uh, of animation from drawing on pellicula, engraving on film, pixelation, synthesized sounds. Um, he had a huge role on how animation was developed in these years. And we were given, they gave us, they said, just pick any work and inspire yourself from it and create a new piece outside for the people to engage with Norman McLaren. And working with, we had worked with the Swings, we also had worked with another project for the Planetarium where we had people, we were working with a choreographer and we saw this. It's called Canon. It was made in 1964. It's with Grant Monroe. It's a series of movement that are repeated in a canon form. And as they are repeated, you see correspondences that happen. So it's all the same choreography, but the way that it's been created and how it is canonized, you have all this uh, storytelling that takes place. So seeing this, we thought, wouldn't it be nice if we could create collective canons live on the street? and explore how people can come together. Like what's nice with the canon is that you have your own series of movement, you have your own choreography, but how it's, canon, how it's presented with others, you, it becomes a collective piece. Of course, the big challenge is will they dance? Who thinks that they will dance? Show of hands. They danced. But it was not easy. We had to, there was a lot of prototyping involved in the studio, working with like setting up our own little recording booth and seeing how we can shape the, uh, the instructions and the interaction for people to, uh, to, to engage. This is a nice little prototype video that we made. One thing that we, we decided to implement to encourage participation was this idea of the Chinese whispers. So this is Pierre who's, doing, who's replicating the choreography from the original Grant Monroe. And Michael is replicating Pierre's choreography. And this is Capucine, who is reproducing Michael's choreography. So slowly, the choreography gets all changed and transformed as people participate. And a new piece is created from the original one. So for the music, we recorded more instruments because they were more participants. We thought it'd be a nice way to identify also the different choreographies, each having their own instrument. So we, we, we recorded up to 12 instruments that were playing the original score. And then we needed to set a little recording studio out side in the cold <laughs> and because there were already, there, was, there were these containers that were hanging around with a lot of graffiti, we thought it'd be, it would fit with the original environment to come up with our own and set, about, set it up as a recording studio. Um, it was important for, uh, for it not just to be a piece but also to create a place. So we, this is a, you can see a little platform here where we built, we, had, we added seating and it cre became a little open air experience. Also in to to mark the, to have signage on the, the container, we were very much inspired by these beautiful notes from McLaren's where he was trying to draw the different types of cannons that exist and we use them to, to mark the, to decorate the, the container and also tell a little bit of what's inside. So these are the different cannons that were presented. And this is the recording studio. So it was just enough intimate to protect you a little bit from the, from the viewers outside, but at the same time open for you to take part. And as you can see, the, the screen worked. We, we would have a double screen where you would have the original choreography or the previous participants and yours, and you simply would imitate the person. And this is how it looked at night. This is the little open air cinema that was created that enabled also one thing that we work a lot is different levels of engagement. Just as with the swings, you can, you know, you can just be a watcher and onlo an onlooker and see the action and enjoy the spectacle, but you can also take part and start swinging. Here you can take part and, and do the choreography. You can put as much love into it or, or just be more straightforward in your imitation. But it was important for people to also have a space to look at the spectacle and also accumulate a bit of critical mass and it all contributes to the hype uh, and the vibe of the place. And this is how it looked. You would have your, your choreography yourself projected very, very big on the facade. And so we recreated another canon.
together based on McLaren's. So it became a really vibrant public place. Early spring when it's still very cold. This is a little film. a little bit from the public. So this is, oh, it was nice to see the different interpretations. Some people would get really into it. So to have a place for expression, some people would go by two, by duos. This is someone imitating the original. No, but we did think we, it would have been nice to have a hat there, maybe next edition. And this is our favorite <laughs> reaction. So <laughs> there was something quite magical of seeing yourself really giant on a big screen. Just that kind of works. But then when you see the different, the correspondences between your movement and the person after you, that was also very magical. You didn't think that you were doing something collective and it ended up being a collective piece. Another element that was very important in working with the, the McLarena, many projection projects, when you see outdoor urban projections, they happen at night and during the day it's back to square one. So because we, we really f believed in how we can re-inject a little bit of placemaking in this area, the, the open air theater, the fact that we added seating was really important because during the day it also helped to, it, that was the trace that was left during the day for people to still be able to use it and give it a sense of a, of a public space, of a square, where you could just sit down, make a phone call, eat a bit of lunch or talk to someone. And that's back to it at night. And you, I like this picture because you see there are people waiting for the bus. And it really just played with all these different dynamics of public spaces and contributed to make it a really vibrant point in the city. And to finish on this project, there's this beautiful quote from McLaren, who says, there's nothing to stop us from combining the different kinds of canon. But be careful, not every melody can be canonized. And the inventor who discovers one that can be deserves a halo. So all in all, in, these, uh, in working on the infinite city, how can, we, how can we invite people to bend the rules and make the city their own and be more active and contribute to its transformation? Well, we really believe that there are these key things to respect, to use existing resources like we've seen with the swings, like there are opportunities in the place. And it's always, um, you, you, A, you save a lot of uh, effort, budget, and also it's more integrated when you use existing stuff that's there. And resources can be things, but they can also be people. So bring people into your process. Um, and everyone does not equal the lowest common denominator. And that's an ex one thing that we're working on in the uh, Amateur Intelligence Radio. Provide a clear invitation or else there will just not be anything <laughs> happening. <laughs> and enable different levels of engagement, like I said, with the McLarena or the Swings. How can, you, how can you have people, like we all have different intentions and different levels of comfort in public spaces, so we all learn together how to, to be there. And how can we reward collaboration? Because ultimately, what we want to do is bring magic, make places, and enable connections. And that's the talk. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Um, that's a good question. Um, not that much. Like you've seen this, uh, like the McLarena container was not, there were no graffitis done on it and it was there for a month and a half in a really sketchy neighborhood in Montreal. Um, it really depends on how you listen to the context and the, I think the quality of what you do. There were friends of, friends 
who, um, who are in architecture often say that only the ugly facades get graffitied. Um, so there's, some, there's that kind of respect that gets uh, installed, but still, I mean, you, um, I think it's more making your stuff robust that's more of a challenge and where we put our effort. And when there are contributions, like for Rewrite the Year, we actually wrote, Eva wrote a beautiful post about that, how, we, how moderation actually became an issue. It was a project where we uh, did not have a chance to go on site before we presented it. And um, it was a community center, not very, uh, quite eccentric in the city, so there were not a lot of people. So they really wanted something interactive, but there was no one in front of the building to interact with, except for a skate park. And we didn't know that. <laughs> so if we would have known that, we would have done a completely different project. Um, but uh, you can imagine like what teenagers had fun writing on a, how they had, the kind of fun they had to rewrite headlines. And again, then the fact that people could also contribute to, through uh, the internet helped to build a critical mass of exciting content for them to be inspired of. But yeah. So when the more, I think the more participation, the more you need to be careful and curate. Yeah. Um, I had a student who did a, a great thesis project for him where he compared um, coffee houses from Vienna in the 19th and up to today, the way they're designed um, to Starbucks in New York City. And one of the things he looked at was the way that the coffee houses in Vienna are designed to make you talk to people. Mm -hmm. um, the seats all look in, they look together, whereas Starbucks, most Starbucks in most cities, certainly in New York, are designed to keep you away from people. And yeah. everyone's plugged in. Yep. And you know, you're, if you try to talk to your neighbor, you're a freak. Um, and you're, you're trying to hustle something and you're just like... Yeah. So what you're doing, it seems to me, is pushing against an enormous trend in 21st century culture um, and, and you're obviously doing it really successfully. Is it your experience that people are interested in the kinds of possibilities of the infinite city but only for a little while or do you sense a desire to do more with this, to have these sorts of experiences more in their lives? Because it strikes me that a lot of urban, urban architecture is designed to discourage people being together for security reasons, for all mm -hmm. sorts of reasons. Yeah, security is an interesting, because I can understand in a cafe, like some cafes, it's nice to still have places for intimacy and for your bubble. And, but I think where we find pleasure is in the collect when people meet and in the collective experiences that can be created. And I think there is a need for that as well. That is, and it's, it's probably, that's why we're a multidisciplinary scenario. I think you need a good group of people from coming from different backgrounds for that to happen. Uh, also being based in Montreal, it's, a, it's an event city. And I think we, uh, we have profited from a lot of expertise from that experience of getting people together and engaging as a group. Um, but yeah, no, it's definitely, uh, collective experiences are, are a wonderful way to push participation because you have people getting to do things together and there's a nice challenge there and there's this profound belief that we need more of that because there are more and more people living in cities, cities are becoming like they're uh, bigger and if we, you know, I think the rise of the rise of technologies are have a tendency to isolate us. So how can we use them in other ways? Like how can we create a physical internet live on our streets and things like that are things that fascinate us. We'll see where, where we go. Um, everything that you've described sounds really wonderful. I wanted to tell you that. Um, could you describe like a twelve month period for your company? Do you have periods where you're extremely busy and times where there's not much going on? What's the 12 month cycle like? Interesting. Um, it varies from year to year. Like we, two years ago, we were working mainly on two big projects, the Amateur Intelligence Radio and another project for the Planetarium. That I should have probably presented you a little bit at least. Um, and then, so we worked like on these two mainly with little projects on the side. Uh, and the year after this year, uh, we realized we, at the beginning of the year, we launched a planetarium and Amateur Intelligence Radio was launched in June. 
And on top of that, we launched five other projects. So <laughs> we were a bit tired in July. Uh, but it was a very, like some years you work a lot, working on, focused on two big projects. And this year we were producing and working on seven projects at the same time. And now we're back to starting new things. So I think the company is still fairly young. So we're finding what's our rhythm and our pace. And we've, exper we've explored different rhythms. One thing that always remains is that spring is always very busy. It's usually where the stuff comes out because when you work out in the public space, it's usually when uh, most people want their projects to happen in the summer. So spring is busy and I guess fall and winter should be where we like think about where we want to go and conceptualize different projects. But it really, it feels more like a mix of everything all the time. <laughs> Um, I hope I answered your question. <laughs> Rick? Um, so just two quick parts yeah. to add to your job description. Since yeah. you're like the tubular rasa, everybody can project themselves on what you do. Um, you're curators. Yeah. You create narrative environments. That's an exhibition. Mm -hmm. you oh, that's interesting. Conversations in public spaces. That's what every curator wants to do. That's true. Anyway, that's just an easy side. <laughs> um, so my real question is this. You described the, uh, the Infinite City sort of overarching project, and a lot of it has to do with creating a critical mass of, mm -hmm. um, you know, just of numbers of bodies that sort of collide, and, and you sort of leveraging that, because that already happens in cities, but kind of directing it in some ways. Yeah. And you these amazing things that happen. Um, have you ever done a project, or how might your approach to projects change in, uh, in, a, in a really rural setting like we're in now. So where some things, givens aren't the same, you yeah. don't have the critical mass of bodies a lot mm. of the time. Or even in this common civic spaces, you might have big gaps of time where there is, isn't the body. Yeah. There might be a body and then there isn't. So there's a lot of time, a lot of space in the country. So, so what would the infinite country look like? Infinite country, I love that. Uh, I think the first thing would be to understand the rhythm of the country life and see what it really needs, because maybe it doesn't need the same critical mass and how it can be. And I, would, I think it would be wonderful to see how the country and the city can be connected and how the city can benefit from the country rhythm and, I don't know, life, and how can both they can benefit from the best <laughs> of their lives. I would say that. Yes? Um, kind of on a more practical level. Uh, how is Please. It dealing with like local boards and government, um, do you find yourself needing to stand your ground a lot, or is it a lot of flexibility and compromise? Um, well, we work on. Yeah, it's interesting because most of our work are arts commissions, so we find a lot of freedom in that, um, and a freedom that as designers you're not even used to sometimes. Um, there are, like, we've had discussions about moderation for Rewrite the Year. Um, for the swings, I think that um, they really like the idea, and they said, if you can convince the engineer, if you can, <laughs> if you can get a sign-off from the engineers, go ahead. <laughs> um, so there's a, yeah, there's some negotiation, but in terms of creativity, we, yeah, we're good. <laughs> we have some freedom. Where do you see your projects going in the future? Um, Technology evolving and cultural changes. Let's do a cloud project. Um, well, I hope that we can. That's where I think even sometimes Muna and I are, we wonder if we should push the public space thing uh, because we don't want to be labeled only as working in public spaces, even if we found it really enriching and we've learned a lot and we love doing it. I think I hope that we can just follow what's happening with how we're growing together. And maybe it will take us to like some micro projects with whatever nanotechnology happens. And I think the connection between groups of people will always be there, but I hope that the means take us to all sorts of places. This way we'll never be bored. <laughs> yeah. Yes. It really varies from um, depending on the project, um, and most of the time we're given an envelope and a time frame, and we work with that. 
Um, it always, there's always a research phase where we look at the public, the space, and the stories. And then there's the ideation where we try to put everything together and see how there's an interaction scenario that can come out of this. And then we need to, and prototyping happens all the way. Like you could see with McLorena, the video I shot was done really early on, where we barely had a sense of how the experience was going to be designed. We started playing with video and see how it can take place. So prototype happens all along the way up to production. Um, and there's the, the design detailing is not to, it's always the thing that we think that will take, um, I don't know, we always underestimate the, the design detailing period. And we also, at the studio, we have an interaction designer, a creative technologist, another wonderful um, person who studied uh, electroacoustics. He's kind of the musician and hardware <laughs> person. Actually, the creative technologist used to be a graphic designer. I think the interaction designer is maybe the less schizophrenic of us all. But um, yeah, we all have different things that we do. Um, but we don't have uh, an industrial designer in-house, so we always work with external collaborators for that. And maybe that explains why we always underestimate the time it takes. Yeah. Do you always know how long a project is going to be on display, or do you kind of determine that as the project goes? Usually we're given that time frame as well, um, but um, like for Union Depot, they said it's a permanent piece, needs to live at least five years. Um, the swings are presented six weeks, but sometimes like the nature of the project can push for longer periods of presentation, if we're good enough. <laughs> How do you think those time frames have like determined the success of your pieces? Um, they, I don't think they have anything to do with the success, um, but if you don't consider the time frame, then maybe you won't have success. Like you, you need to, for it to, to make it work in the amount of time that we, you're given. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is your process that like you come up with an idea and then you look for a space, or is it that someone like co comes to you and says we have this space and we want you to do some sort of visual? Most of the time, there's a space that starts, and it's really, it, and we love that because it's a wonderful context to work with. We always uh, we feel a bit lost when we don't have a context um, because of the way we, we work. And there's always something interesting because we work with the Institu and like the Swings project, it was really made for that space, working on these structures, but we found something universal from that study. And in the end, you have the 10 Swings that are touring all over the world and that work in any space. So there's that nice little balance of working in context, finding the essence of things, and finding a traveling format. Where are some ideas that didn't work out and why? <laughs> uh, let me think. In the book of Faili Tous Les Jours. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, we always end up making them work. All of the projects you've seen have had phases that really were disasters. Um, before you started them, in a planning stage, not that. Oh, okay. Like bad ideas? Right. Plain bad ideas? Yeah. <laughs> I think I forget Plain about these. Plain bad ideas. <laughs> I know, but... Because um, usually, like, you understand that an idea is bad when you start working on it, when it gets out of the idea stage. Um, I don't think there's such thing as a bad idea. Like, an idea that got rejected... We, d we also, like, usually just present one idea. <laughs> <laughs> and we work it with the, you know, with the people on site or with the client. Um, I mean, we've had, it's more, the challenge is more with the implementation. We've had this, uh, this summer, we had this beautiful idea. We were working on, a, in a small town in Quebec City um, that was devastated by a train accident. Very sad story. And we were there trying to better their public spaces and re-give them a place to meet and to remember. And, we, and it's also a place that's known for its sky. It's like a UNESCO uh, site for observation of the stars. And we, gave, we thought that we had this brilliant idea to make hammocks, giant hammocks for them to look at the stars together. And uh, the whole approach of the project was to do everything with the community so that they understand why we're doing that and they have a piece in the larger piece, everyone owns it, and so we. There's also this thing called the Le Cercle des Fermières in Quebec, the farmer women circle that we worked, we wanted to work with. In the end, it was not possible, but the idea of hand knitting these hammocks was uh, 
was <coughs> was accepted <laughs> and uh, it became it's really a lot of work that's what we learned it's really a lot of work to to to, to weave giant hammocks and um <coughs> and giant hammocks may <laughs> have a have a very close um really look like trampolines <laughs> <laughs> and are often used like trampolines so uh so yeah but uh, we were working on this <laughs> Mm. Okay, uh, yeah, Jonathan. I, I, I guess just in conjunction with the previous question and then to nicely phrase, uh, one of the nicely phrased the big one of the landing slides which said that um, everyone does not equal the lowest common denominator. Uh, and then also what you just said was that you go to your client with one idea. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you structure that conversation? When you say this is our kind of strange, really cool, wonderful <laughs> idea that you probably weren't expecting, or maybe weren't mm -hmm. because they, they decided to work with you, but maybe they weren't expecting something quite that mm -hmm. cool, right? <laughs> how do you how do you convince people, especially before you have something to show them, or what what do you show them to sort of convince that this one idea, the one idea that you're showing them, is is the one that they should go with? Um, yeah, I guess that's where storytelling is handy, like uh, taking them through scenarios so that they can imagine really well where we want to go. Um, often the challenge is that we, um, the piece is not, you know, the amateur intelligence radio, we knew we wanted a robot voice that would tell stories, that would be intelligent, pull, pulling information from the space and having people tell stories on top of that. We did not know the shape of the furniture when we pitched the idea. We didn't know exactly, I think at, at the beginning it was like one big stage where we had the whole radio taking place there. So I think also the fact that you present the idea at different stages, you kind of bring the people along with you in the journey of imagining this thing. So at first they'll, they'll like this and they'll say, but, uh, but we're a bit concerned about how the radio is community, is, you know, how it takes how it, how it is physical in the space, and you're like, okay, yeah, we'll work on it. You come back and you, you listen to their concerns and, and, and come back with a solution. And so it, it feels like a collaboration with them as well. Yeah. Yes, um, sorry, I'm really bad at it. I know you tailor your projects very much to the, to the very local, very intimate environments. Mm. Have you ever had the chance, or would you be interested in taking um, any one, like the, the Max Moreno one was the one that struck me, and saying, let's try this in Chicago, or, or and to see <coughs> yeah. how, because I, I was, I'm Canadian too, and I was thinking that would never work in Toronto. Um, <laughs> no. um, I it depends it. where, maybe. But it, yeah, do you know what I mean? It mm -hmm. would be fun to see how people in you know, San Francisco do something like that, because I'm guessing very few Canadians know the don't have to know something about it to get yeah. into that and have fun with that. But like a, a bit like the swings we find with the McLarena is that we found the, the, like the stem of an idea that can take different lives. Yeah. I think we would really like to bring it to other cities and maybe work with local choreographers um, that people know and see how they can, because that was also something that, um, that contributed to I wouldn't say people participating, but it created this familiarity. Everyone has heard about Norman McLaren, so there's that little attachment. That's not, you know, it's not going to be what makes you dance, but still creates that little ground of familiarity. Um, but also, it would just be wonderful to see how the project transforms itself through different eyes of choreographers or filmmakers. If you do something like McLaren in Japan or a culture <laughs> like that, that would be to see what you know, yeah. they would Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> Anyone going to Tokyo soon? <laughs> retreat to the reception, but I would encourage you to keep asking questions um, and have curious discussion outside. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.